As the DS brand points out, beyond the motor industry, three of the world's top five luxury brands are French. Why shouldn't Gallic style be equally desirable when it comes to cars? Perhaps it will be with this one, the first of the company's very own designs, the DS7 Crossback Premium Mid-Sized SUV. If you want a premium mid-sized SUV in the current market, you're not short of choice, but there's nothing quite like this, the DS7 Crossback. We wouldn't blame you for being unfamiliar with the DS brand. Uh, used on upmarket Citroens in the 50s, it was a nameplate reintroduced by that mark in 2010 before being announced by the company's PSA parent group as a standalone brand in 2014. For most of the next four years, uh, DS models were little more than rebadged Citroens. This one, though, launched in early 2018, is the company's first purpose design contender. And it's the first of six all new cars it plans to introduce over the next few years. Under the skin lies much that's shared with mid sized Peugeots and Citroëns, but it's all been covered with a thick sheen of Gallic gloss that could represent a refreshing alternative to the Teutonic ambiance, which tends to dominate amongst premium mid sized SUV models of this sort. Uh, the DS people have been quite clever about this crossover sizing too, using the same PSO Group EMP2 platform, but stretching it so as to give this car most of the interior space that you'll find in a D segment premium SUV, so think an Audi Q5 or BMW X3, but at a price that's closer to that you'll pay for a C segment premium SUV contender, uh, think an Audi Q3 or a BMW X1. There are a few signs of classic DS innovation too. Now, given that marks heritage in pioneering suspension technology, it's appropriate that the highlight here is a camera-driven active damping system that uh, sets new standards in this sector, recognizing bumps and road undulations before you even reach them. Features like adaptive headlights and a DS connected pilot package that gives you level two autonomous driving capability will be rather more familiar to buyers looking at the latest models of this kind. But this crossback aims to set itself apart with a uniquely sumptuous tactile interior. The idea is to bring a bit of Louis Vuitton and Chanel to the mid-sized premium segment. Like the sound of that? Well, then maybe you ought to join us in checking out what's on offer here. Let's put this car to the test. At last, a DS model that rides as a DS model should. Modern era products from the brand have generally fallen short here. The most recent DS4 and DS5 hatch is notable not for wafting over uneven surfaces with typical Gallic nonchalance, but for acquainting their drivers intimately with every undulation and tarmac tear, which was disappointing given the company's heritage in this regard. Ride quality was, after all, the standout attribute of the original DS model that was created by Italian sculptor Flaminio Bertoni and French uh, aeronautics engineer Andre Lefebvre back in 1955. Its hydropneumatic suspension system, activated through a complicated system of gas spheres, quite simply transformed people's expectations of the way that a luxurious car could ride over bumpy roads. Mercedes were among a number of prestigious brands that subsequently copied this design, uh, so it is perhaps appropriate that today's DS engineers have returned that compliment by developing their own version of the camera-driven active suspension system that we first saw back in 2013 on the sixth-generation Mercedes S-Class. This kind of setup is still virtually unknown on more affordable models uh, and its democratization and integration into this DS7 Crossback is a welcome development that competitors will have to copy. The French maker calls its setup DS Active Scan, and as with the rival Mercedes Magic Body Control Package, uh, the concept is based around a forward-facing windscreen-mounted camera that at speeds of over 50 miles an hour scans the topography of the road for up to 25 meters ahead as you drive. 
bumps and potholes are identified before you get to them and the dampers adjusted accordingly with initial softening which reduces the abruptness of the car's first contact with the undulation and then subsequent stiffening which controls the body pitching that you'd normally get. Now you uh, notice this particularly over low speed obstacles like speed humps over which the DS7 cruises with silk and ease. It's worth pointing out that active scan can't be had with the entry level models and a little annoyingly it, it only works when you switch into the comfort driving mode which is provided as an integral part of this active suspension package. The other settings included regardless of your DS7 spec are normal, eco and sport, uh, the latter more dynamic option delivering the dubious benefits of speaker generated engine noise and an over sensitive throttle pedal. It's a pity that active scan doesn't work in sport because it would give this French contender an extra sure-footedness through fast secondary road corners that it uh, currently lacks. Still, that's not the kind of driving that this car responds particularly well to. It's at its best when you're just wafting along and enjoying this Gallic model more relaxed approach to life. And that's something that you'll be better equipped for if, like most DS7 buyers, you opt for the 2-litre Blue HDI 180 diesel power plant we're trying here. Uh, like all the conventional engines fitted this car, it drives only through the front wheels, uh, transmitting through them a lusty 400 newton meters of torque that's controlled by the mandatory provision of the the PSO Group's latest 8-speed EAT8 automatic transmission. Uh, this gearbox slurs smoothly through its various ratios, but it can get with the program and play its part in propelling you from rest to 62 mph in 9.4 seconds en route to 134 miles an hour, should the need arise to do so. As for the other engines on offer, well, an alternative diesel option is a 1.5 litre, 130 bhp Blue HDI unit that can be had only with manual transmission and which returns performance figures of rest to 62 in 10.8 seconds uh, on the way to 121 miles an hour. If you're more interested in petrol power, uh, then you'll want to know about the three conventional green pump fuel power plants that have been developed for use with this model. Now you can talk to your dealer about the entry level three cylinder 1.2 litre PureTech 130 engine or consider one of the auto orientated 1.6 litre THP options, the PureTech 180 and the PureTech 225. Uh, the latter variant is capable of rest to 62 in 8.3 seconds en route to 141 miles an hour. If you have something of an eco mindset, then you might want to strike up a conversation uh, with your DS store about the merits of what is without doubt the cleverest variant in the range, the E-Tense 4x4 plug-in petrol-electric hybrid variant. Here, a 200 HP version of that 1.6 litre petrol engine is combined with that EAT8 auto gearbox and mated to a couple of 80 kilowatt motors which boost total output to 300 HP. The motors are powered by a 13 kilowatt hour, 90 kilowatt lithium ion battery and one sits on each axle. Uh, the powered rear axle is what provides this variant's four wheel drive capability. Talking of four-wheel drive, let's finish with references to this DS7's prowess, or otherwise, uh, off a paved surface. Now, you wouldn't expect that to amount to much, and it doesn't. Uh, but you could get a surprising distance on something like a light forest track if you were to specify this car with the optional advanced grip control system. Now, this is one of those uh, setups that tweaks the ESP stability control system to maximize front-wheel grip in slippery or snowy conditions, and it comes packaged up with special mud and snow tyres. Grip control copies Land Rover's terrain response setup in offering the driver the chance to choose uh, between different settings to suit different services. Uh, five separate modes are on offer, uh, normal, snow, mud, sand and ESP off. None of this is of course able to make this car into any kind of mud plugger but in combination with a reasonable amount of ground clearance it is all enough to potentially make it a good deal more capable in a snowy snap than some of its competitors. Which is interesting, but not especially relevant to likely DS7 crossback buyers, uh, people who would be more interested in the technology that this car can offer. Uh, the DS Connected Pilot System, for example, which delivers so-called Level 2 autonomous driving. That comes courtesy of Adaptive Cruise Control and a Lane Keeping Assist Package, which is intended for use in traffic jams and on motorways, and which can virtually allow the car to drive itself at speeds of up to 112 miles an hour. 
You'll also like the DS Night Vision full LED headlights that produce a sweeping beam adaptable to road conditions and vehicle speed via five fully automated modes, parking, town beam, country beam, uh, motorway beam and adverse weather. Now this car can also uh, automatically park itself and use an optional DS night vision system to alert you to people and animals who might be about to step into your path in the dark. In short, it's very clever. It wasn't difficult to predict that this DS7 would be somewhat conventional in form. Uh, the DS brand has, after all, had its fingers burnt in recent years with innovative looking DS4 and DS5 hatchback models that customers largely didn't want. What it seems the market prefers is familiar shaping spiced up with a few extra stylized features, which is the formula that the Gallic brand followed with its wildly successful DS3 Sporty Super Mini. So that's what we've got once again here. To be fair, uh, the detailing is very nicely done, particularly here at the front end, uh, the look of which was inspired by the avant-garde DS Divine concept car of 2014. Now, I particularly like these exotically intricate DS Active Vision LED headlamps, which emit a purple light when the car's unlocked uh, before pivoting by 180 degrees. That's in a nod to the original 50s DS model's clever swiveling front lights. Uh, once fully illuminated, their light signature remains distinctive, and it's complemented by these vertically beaded uh, daytime running lamps which frame the corners of the bumper and which combine with trendy strolling indicators. If you like your automotive jewellery, you'll absolutely love it. Uh, subtle angled bonnet crease lines flow into this diamond effect grille from which horizontal chrome trimming strips, uh, the brand calls these DS wings, spear into the headlamp clusters. And further down, uh, there's a kind of uh, silvered skid plate style panel which today seems obligatory on almost any kind of SUV. There is less tinsel from a profile perspective, just smart suited conformity with the segment styling standard. Uh, there are the usual roof rails and the normal mid-level crease that flows uh, just below the glass house. Now this one loses itself in the back door before it reappears to emphasize those rear haunches. Further down, a lower swage line gives the flank some shape and it separates uh, stylized wheels which vary between uh, 18 inches in size to 20 inches on this top variant. Now the DS designers apparently debated long and hard about overall body length. They eventually settled on a 4.57 meter figure that quite intentionally positions the size of this car uh, midway between Audi Q3 sized C segment premium SUVs and Audi Q5 type D segment models. Now we'll come back to that later. Possibly our favourite perspective is the one that's usually most forgettable when it comes to cars of this kind, uh, the rear. Uh, the wraparound tailgate is embellished with what the brand likes to call hypnotic rear lights. Super slim 3D strips with scrolling indicators. Each lamp is a full LED made up of illuminated scales. Um, wide reflectors bejewel the top edge of the bumper, while lower down, silver highlights are used to pick out the exhaust outlets and the faux skid plate trimming. It's a sleek, flowing design which is well it's spoiled a little by this clunky rear screen wiper but it's topped off nicely by this neat upper roof spoiler. As for the stuff you can't see, well, under the skin sits a stretched version of the EMP2 platform, which is also used by the Peugeot 3008 SUV, and that flows down the same French Mulhouse production line. The brand saves its boldest flourishes though for the interior. Now if you like Teutonic simplicity and clarity of form, you better look away now. What's served up here is a glorious antidote to all that. A celebration, the DS designers hope, of everything that's cutting edge in French fashion. So angled switches cascade along the centre console, uh, the chromed Corner vents are pyramidical with a studded jeweled finish and Alcantara open pour wood inlays and leather feature in quantities appropriate to the Parisian themed trim package you've chosen. Now, rather nauseously, the DS people call these inspirations. Uh, the base variant gets a Bastille theme, uh, while top versions get Rivoli and Opera packages, although more copiously trimmed in stitched quilted leather and diamond style decoration. If you're tempted to ignore all that and stay with the slightly more conventional Alcantara themed uh, mid-range performance line trimmed interior, uh, we really wouldn't blame you.
even the techno fest that has to rather incongruously fit in around all this frippery can't escape the Louis Vuitton treatment. So the supersized 12-inch infotainment touchscreen that struggles to fit in at the top of the centre stack here gets a strange serrated uh, barrel-style centre volume dial. And like this 12-inch instrument binnacle TFT monitor, it can be configured via a DS sensorial drive feature to display its information in shades of either cashmere or titanium. It's worth pointing out that with entry-level elegance trim, you have to make do with an 8-inch centre screen and the usual analogue instrument dials. Most, though, will want to stretch to a variant with the bigger infotainment monitor and this virtual instrument package. Now, this is a DS-themed version of the setup that you get in the Peugeot 3008, and as there, it's one of those which is configurable in a number of ways to show the information that's most useful to you, including a large navigation map. Uh, now, you view everything through this odd uh, angular four-spoke wheel, which has a rim that's so thick that it's well it's almost like grasping a leather trimmed wine bottle uh, also plumply upholstered are the seats and they are ever more opulently finished as you uh, ascend the range and of course they can uh, as well as the usual heating feature ventilation and massage Ergonomic oversights are remarkably few, considering the stylized eccentricity on display here. Uh, the all-round visibility you get from your properly raised SUV-style driving perch, for example, is extremely good, although DS has fitted rear parking sensors across the range, just to make sure. Uh, the center stack touchscreen, which incorporates an eight-speaker DAB audio system and phone mirroring functionality, that could do with some proper physical buttons rather than this provided row of touch-sensitive lower switches. Uh, they they often leave you needing to look away from the road to check whether you've selected the right setting. Uh, this monitor's responses could be faster too, and that can be frustrating because, uh, unfortunately, you have to use this for control of the climate and ventilation, and that often means uh, there's an annoying need to constantly switch back and forth between menu screens. Um, otherwise, there's really not much else to take issue with, as provided you don't mind a few hard plastics further down the dash, and you don't object to the frankly rather weird revolving clock from French horologist BRM that adorns the leather-stitched dashboard top of plusher models. There's not much point in having frippery functionality like that, though, if basics like cabin storage haven't been properly dealt with. Uh, before fussing around with trendy timepieces, we'd prefer that the DS designers concentrated on finding a way of engineering right-hand drive models so that the majority of space in the glove box wasn't taken up with a fuse box, which has once again happened here. Uh, to be fair, that is compensated for by a lot of storage space elsewhere. Uh, most of it is in this simply enormous uh, air-conditioned box between the seats with its neat stitched butterfly opening lid, its illuminated interior and a lift-out tray. Uh, in front of this lie two large cup holders, plus there's a further storage slot just here behind the gear stick and another covered area in front of that which is intended for your phone, hence the uh, nearby USB and 12 volt ports. The door bins, they're also reasonably sized, they include recesses for bottles and they come carpeted to stop loose items from rattling around. Uh, there's no overhead compartment for your sunglasses though. Time to take a seat in the rear. Now, earlier, we talked about the significant extra body length this car enjoys over some of its C-segment premium SUV rivals, and that is obviously a boom when it comes to situations like getting elderly relatives or child seats in and out. And once inside, well, in the back seat of premium C-segment competitors like, uh, say, the BMW X1, the Audi Q3, or the Mercedes GLA, you're always left feeling that you've paid an awful lot of money for a car that's no more spacious than a humble Focus or Astra hatch. Now, it is different in a DS7. Even for a six-footer sitting behind quite a lanky front seat occupant, the legroom on offer should be quite sufficient. Headroom, too, that's fine. Uh, that's providing you haven't got the panoramic glass roof that we have here. That does restrict it a little. Uh, the floor is a little high, though, and it forces your knees a little further upwards than they would normally be. At least, though, it doesn't feature the uh, kind of prominent centre transmission panel that you get with many rivals. And that makes uh, fitting in a middle seat passenger, well, a little easier than it would normally be.
If there are only two of you, then this centre armrest can be folded down, revealing a couple of useful cup holders. Uh, as you'd expect, uh, there are Isofix child seat mounts on the two outer seats, along with uh, narrow door bins, twin USB ports, a storage cubby next to these uh, twin central vents, and netted seat back pockets. What else? Well, the seat back reclines from 23 to 32 degrees in rake electrically on this top model, which is nice for longer journeys. Unfortunately, though, there's no sliding mechanism for the seat base, which is a pity. Finally, let's take a look in the boot. Now here we've got the powered foot swipe activated tailgate that on mainstream models uh, comes as part of the easy access pack. You don't really need it though because this hatch is actually quite light to lift. Uh, once it is raised, an impressively large 555 litre capacity is revealed. That's definitely more D segment than C segment. And now you'll want this dual height boot floor that allows you to make the most of that space. Uh, annoyingly though, uh, unless you stretch to a really luxurious trim level, it's an extra cost modularity pack option which also gives you uh, that 12 volt socket and a chromed entry sill which will get quickly scratched if you're not very careful. Um, what else? Uh, well there is a bag hook, there's a useful elasticated strap on the right hand cargo sidewall and you get these corner storage areas with removable side panels and that'll make it easy to transport wider items. Under the cargo floor uh, the space is completely taken up by this a space saver spare wheel and that's a good thing given that this models Peugeot and Citroen SUV cousins and plenty of other SUV rivals too fob you off with a tyre inflation kit. Uh, you get a standard centre ski hatch across the range too or at least you do if you haven't got the electrically operated seat package. Now we do have that here which is why rather annoyingly we don't have that um, central push through functionality with this particular car. Whatever kind of DS7 variant you have, um, if you can't quite fit suitcases or push chairs in, there is the versatility of being able to position the rear backrest at a slightly more upright angle. Now that might just be enough to allow you to close the tailgate. Um, otherwise, you'll have to use these uh, cargo sidewall catches and push forward the 6040 split seat, which will free up 1,752 litres of total fresh air. If, like us, you're not quite sure whether this DS7 Crossback competes against C-segment premium SUVs like Audi's Q3 or BMW's X1, or D-segment premium SUVs like Audi's Q5 or BMW's X3, then the price list won't help very much because it spans both sectors, ranging from around £28,000 to nearly £45,000. Uh, there are four trim levels, Elegance, Performance Line, Prestige and Ultra Prestige, uh, and they feature four distinctly styled interior packages, DS calls them inspirations and they're mostly themed and styled around the perceived ambiance of various Parisian districts and we'll get to those in a minute. Before we do, you'll want to know about the various engine and transmission options, and you'll need to be aware that all mainstream models come only in front-driven form. Now, the core DS7 lineup is built around three petrol engines and two diesels. Those shopping at the bottom of the range can ask their dealer about a 130bhp, 1.2-litre PureTech petrol power plant, but they're more likely to opt for the 1.5-litre Blue HDI 130 diesel unit, which can only be paired with manual transmission. Uh, there are also two versions of the older tech 1.6 litre THP petrol turbo engine that PSA group brands have been using for some time. Uh, the here badged PureTech 180 and PureTech 225 are those figures designate engine outputs. A significant number of buyers, though, are going to want a diesel, and if they can afford to stretch beyond that 1.5-litre Blue HDI entry-level unit I just mentioned, then the power plant that they're likely to want is the 2-litre Blue HDI 180 engine that we're trying here. Now, that's if they're not put off by the fact that it costs nearly £5,000 more with an equivalent level of trim. Uh, to be fair, though, that premium does get you automatic transmission. This top diesel unit, just like the top petrol engine, has to come with a self-shifter. But it does still mean that for a mid-range performance line Blue HDI 180 version of this model, you'll be needing a budget in the territory of £37,000. 
Now, the DS brand understands that before spending that kind of money on an unfamiliar product, you're going to need to be pretty convinced. And they're also aware that exposure to this car might be difficult, given that there are only around 60 DS brand sales points around the UK. Hence, a DS only you service, which will see a trained sales expert bring a car to wherever you happen to be. Now, that person can also brief you on the most sophisticated DS7 Crossback model, the E-Tense plug-in hybrid petrol-electric derivative. Now that is the only variant that is available with any sort of four-wheel drive system. And that comes courtesy of two electric motors, uh, one on the front axle and one at the rear, which together boost the 1.6 litre engine's 200 bhp standard output to 300 bhp. Enough on the DS7 range, let's get on to the question of how mainstream variants square up to potential rivals, at which point we find ourselves back at that segmentation issue we started with. So what exactly do you directly compare this car with? Well, potentially an awful lot of different mid-sized crossovers. Uh, now, DS says that it set out to design a C-segment Audi Q3 or BMW X1 style model, but pushed the boundaries in terms of the size that such a car could be. Uh, the average premium C-segment SUV contender is about 4.4 metres long. The average premium D-segment Audi Q5 or BMW X3 style model is about 4.7 metres long. A DS7 Crossback, in contrast, is 4.57 metres in length. Get the idea? Um, now, a compromise between these two class sizes isn't particularly unusual in volume brand mid-sized SUVs. Uh, so models like a Toyota's RAV4, Honda's CRV, and Jeep's Cherokee, they all measure in at about the same length. It is a bit more unusual though in models like this one that have more credibly premium mid-sized SUV aspirations. Uh, now the Lexus NX has threatened the status quo in this regard, but that is a low volume hybrid option. Otherwise, the upmarket German makers seem to have their rules about this sort of thing. And, quite rightly, this DS7 Crossback tramples all over them. So, you get the point. The DS people are casting their nets widely here, and we could spend the next 10 minutes reeling off a list of theoretical potential rivals. Rather than doing that, though, it's probably more helpful to make a few general points. Now, first, entry-level elegant spec DS7 Crossback models won't cost you very much more than base versions of equivalent premium C-segment rivals. And by that we mean, of course, the Audi Q3 and BMW X1 models already mentioned. But also cars like the Mercedes GLA, uh, the Jaguar E-Pace and the Volvo XC40. In fact, the least expensive versions of models like the Infiniti QX30 and, perhaps more relevantly, the Range Rover Evoque will actually cost you slightly more than a DS7 in elegance guise. All these fashionable SUVs are being specifically targeted by the DS people here. However, as the exalted pricing of upper-spec versions of this car suggests, the French brand also hopes to interest potential buyers who are looking for something a little different than the premium SUV D segment, where slightly larger cars like the Audi Q5, uh, the BMW X3 and the Mercedes GLC dominate. Now, a DS7 buyer is uh, probably something who will be looking beyond those predictable choices, maybe at cars like the Volvo XC60, uh, the Jaguar F-Pace, the Alfa Romeo Stelvio or perhaps that Lexus NX model just mentioned. Um, whatever the rival you have in mind, uh, you'll probably find that this cross pack can undercut it by a couple of thousand or so. Uh, that's particularly when standard specifications are matched up, uh, while offering nearly as much interior space and practicality. So being different doesn't necessarily mean being imprudent. If, having considered all of that, you'll find your interest growing in this DS7, uh, then you might be further convinced once you consider the standard spec list. It's full of items that would often cost you more on obvious premium segment rivals. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the trim range kicks off with elegant spec, and even this includes 18-inch diamond-cut alloy wheels, automatic headlamps with LED daytime illumination, uh, LED front fog lamps and rear tail lamps, rear parking sensors, uh, rain sensing wipers, powered heated mirrors, uh, an acoustic heated tinted windscreen and a parametric alarm. Now you also get a space over spare wheel. Move inside and you'll find a Bastille themed inspiration trimming pack for the cabin and that has subtle finishes using warm gold and silver accents. Cabin kit also includes automatic bi-zone air conditioning, uh, a multifunction trip computer, cruise control and a rear seat ski hatch. 
The majority of DS7 buyers in this country, though, will find the necessary premium uh, around £3,500 to trade up to mid-range performance line spec. Models of this grade are recognisable by larger 19-inch black onyx diamond cut wheels, uh, roof rails and rear privacy glass. Now you have to stretch up to at least this level in the range to get the two large cockpit screens, uh, the 12.3 inch virtual instrument cluster and the 12 inch centre dash infotainment screen and that incorporates voice recognition and DS Connect navigation. Uh, the display style of these monitors can be altered uh, through two themes via a DS sensorial drive package and that also includes polyambient lighting in the door panels and that's variable through eight colours. Um, other key performance line features, uh, well they include DS Active LED Vision headlamps, now those adapt to road conditions and they feature high beam assist and also stitched Alcantara trimming for the dashboard and the door cards. Plus, you also get premium stitched leather for the steering wheel, uh, for the gear stick, um, power folding mirrors, power front seat lumbar support, uh, a frameless electrochrome rear view mirror, aluminium pedals and a front central armrest. Now, if you go for the Blue HDI 180 diesel engine with this trim level, you also benefit from the desirable DS Active Scan system. Now, that reads the road ahead and anticipates bumps before you get to them and pre-programs the suspension to ease them away. The next step up in the DS7 hierarchy is Prestige, and that's recognisable outside by its Roma-style 19-inch alloy wheels and inside by a Rivoli trimming package that uses premium quilted Nappa leather and diamond-shaped decorative features. Plus, you get crystal facial controls and a unique centre dash R180 analog clock created by French horologist BRM. At this level, you can also expect keyless entry, a full LED interior lighting package, uh, a wireless smartphone charging mat, front seats that are heated, uh, powered, ventilated and electrically adjustable, a powered rear seat backrest, an adjustable height boot floor and a package of camera-driven safety features that we'll cover off in a minute. Uh, now, you Providing you avoid the base Blue HDI 130 diesel engine, you'll get that DS Active Scan system too. At the very top of the range lie the Ultra Prestige models, recognisable outside by black Onyx Tokyo style 20 inch alloy wheels and inside by an Opera trimming package that uses basalt black and chestnut brown shades of quilted Nappa leather. Now this is the level in the lineup that you'll need to stretch to for the standard fitment of two of the DS7's most desirable features, uh, the 14 speaker Focal Electra Hi-Fi system and the DS Connected Pilot package which will give this car full level 2 autonomous driving capability using adaptive cruise control and lane keeping assist. Um, other ultra prestige features include a powered tailgate with foot swipe functionality, laminated front and rear windows and a large panoramic glass sunroof. On to extras and options, uh, now we'd strongly suggest you consider adding in the grip control system and that's a £400 option that maximises front wheel traction in slippery conditions and it comes with grippier mud and snow tyres. Uh, much less important is the expensive optional DS night vision pack and that uses night vision technology to identify and picture on the dash people or animals who might be about to move into your path after dark. Uh, most models can also be ordered with a DS Urban Pack, and that'll give you two things, a 360-degree surround-view camera and a DS Park Assist system, which will automatically steer you into spaces. Uh, a number of the features we've referenced on the plusher models can be ordered as individual options further down the range. Uh, the Focal Electra Hi-Fi setup, uh, the DS Connected Pilot Autonomous Driving Pack, the Interior Ambient Lighting System, uh, the Panoramic Roof and the Powered Tailgate for example. So don't automatically opt for an expensive spec level that you might not need. Uh, a DS Connected Cam Camera can be added into the top of the windscreen to take pictures or film as you drive. And a tow bar is optional, of course. In addition, while we're being practical on DS7 models lacking one of the prestige trim levels, we'd want the modularity pack, and that gives you the adjustable height boot floor. Performance line buyers will also be offered a connected pack, and that will give them uh, a reversing camera and a wireless smartphone charging mat, and also an electric seat pack, which will give the seats powered adjustment front and rear. 
On to aesthetics. Uh, now, unless you want your DS7 Crossback finished in polar white, you're going to have to pay extra for one of the metallic or pearlescent shades. And the 20 inch Tokyo alloy wheels that are used with top ultra prestige trim are optionally available to uh, performance line and prestige buyers. On to safety. Uh, as you'd expect, there are all the usual things. Twin front side and curtain airbags, Isofix charge seat fastenings, and the usual electronic assistance for braking, traction, and stability control. Plus, there's driver attention warning, and that's a timed system that will warn you if the electronics sense from your reactions that you're getting drowsy at the wheel. In addition, you'll want to know about the cutting-edge electronic radar-driven stuff, and there's plenty of that. Uh, all versions of this DS get autonomous braking, an active safety brake system uh, which detects hazards ahead and which will apply the brakes if the driver doesn't react. There's also a lane departure warning system which will alert you if you drift out of your lane on the highway. Hill start assist, a speed limit recognition warning and that'll picture road signs as you pass them and then display them on the dash. And if you specify a tow bar, trailer stability control too. Plus, you get the brand's DS Connect box package that'll automatically alert the emergency services with your exact location if the airbags go off. Avoid entry level trim and your DS7 will also come with high beam assist and and rear lateral and curtain airbags too. If you want to go further, you're going to need to get your car fitted with the Advanced Safety Pack, which is standard on the two Prestige trim levels and optional further down the range. Uh, there are two really key inclusions here, an active blind spot detection system that will alert you if on the move you're about to dangerously pull out in front of another vehicle, and a lane keeping assist setup that in highway motoring uh, will apply gentle steering assistance to keep the car exactly where it should be in its designated lane. It used to be that there was a weight penalty and therefore an efficiency penalty for choosing an SUV over a more conventional saloon hatch or estate, but things can change. And as proof that in some cases they have, uh, we're going to use this DS7 Crossback as an example. So let's say you were considering the volume HDI 130 diesel version of this car as a more versatile alternative to, say, a similarly priced premium compact executive estate, a BMW 3 Series Touring or a Mercedes so the C-Class estate, for example. In both cases, equivalent base diesel versions of both diesel models weigh about 160 kilos more. Now that translates into a fuel and CO2 efficiency penalty over the DS of about 5% if you're going to choose the Merc and about 15% if you're going to opt for the BMW. Now you might say, reasonably enough, that it's more relevant to compare this French contender's efficiency showing to the C-segment premium SUVs that the brand primarily wants it to compete against. Uh, so let's do just that. And uh, despite the fact that it's a significantly bigger car than, say, regular choices in that sector, like the BMW X1 and the Mercedes GLA, uh, base diesel DS7 matches those competitors almost exactly in terms of combined fuel economy and CO2 emissions. Again, lightweight makes this showing possible. A base diesel version of this crossback model tips the scales at just 1,420 kilos. That's 85 kilos less than those two German rivals. Of course, if you choose to compare this car instead to SUV models in the slightly larger premium D segment, and we could see it potentially tempting quite a few customers who might be looking at a BMW X3 or a Mercedes GLC, then this uh, French SUV's advantage will be considerable. Primarily, this kind of showing has been made possible by the stiff, sophisticated EMP2 platform this car borrows from the PSA conglomerate's parts bin. And of course, it's further helped by the intrinsic efficiency of the PureTech petrol and Blue HDI diesel engines that this DS7 also borrows from that group's development resource. An eco-driving mode maximizes the frugality of those units, and the EAT8 auto gearbox has a freewheeling setting which can disconnect the transmission from the drivetrain at a cruise. So let's get to the exact figures those engines can produce. Uh, the base 1.5 litre Blue HDI 130 manual diesel model I've been talking about manages 68.9 mpg on the combined cycle and 107 grams per kilometre of CO2. 
So to give you some extra class perspective on that, uh, a base diesel Jaguar E-Pace delivers 60.1 mpg and 124 grams per kilometre. That's a legacy of the fact that that smaller rival model is over 350 kilos heavier, but then we're back to issues of weight again. With the older tech 2-litre Blue HDI diesel engine that we're trying today, uh, this DS model's advantage over its rivals uh, isn't quite as pronounced, but it's still impressive given the size and interior space on offer here. With this variant, 57.6 mpg on the combined cycle and 128 grams per kilometre of CO2 is possible. Uh, the petrol models also put in a strong showing, especially the three-cylinder 1.2-litre entry-level PureTech 130 variant. And that manages over 50 mpg on the combined cycle and under 120 grams per kilometre of CO2. Even the top PureTech 225 petrol turbo variant delivers 48.7 mpg on the combined cycle and 134 grams per kilometre of CO2. And that's not bad for a high performance automatic luxury mid sized SUV that's capable of over 140 miles an hour. As usual though, the most significant gains you can make in running cost efficiency when it comes to a car of this kind depends upon your having the funds to finance the purchase of an electrified powertrain. Now in this case, uh, that is available via the E-Tense petrol electric plug-in hybrid variant that you can talk to your dealer about. Now with this derivative, two 80 kilowatt electric motors uh, powered by a 13 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery positioned under the rear seat are mated with a 200 HP version of of the 1.6 seater PureTech petrol engine. The resulting package offers owners a choice of three driving modes, hybrid, combined, or 100% electric. That latter setting is able to allow for up to 37 miles of all electric driving. That is providing, of course, that the lithium ion battery is fully charged, and that's a process that takes uh, four and a half hours from a conventional plug. That charging time can be reduced to two and a half hours if you get yourself all properly organized by making sure you have a 32 amp socket in your garage and plugging it into the 6.6 kilowatt charger that your dealer will be able to supply. Of course, running costs are about a lot more than just fuel economy and CO2 readings and driving range. Uh, so what else are you going to need to know? Well, uh, there is the usual unremarkable three-year 60,000-mile warranty and service intervals there every year or every 20,000 miles with normal usage or every year and 12,500 miles if the car is regularly driven in arduous conditions. Residual values, they're also going to be key to whole-life running costs. Now, these are rather difficult to accurately predict for a new product from a relatively new brand but initial signs from the industry are encouraging here and this car's uh, comparative rarity will certainly help. Finally, let's give you an idea of what you'll be looking at when it comes to insurance groupings. Uh, the 1.5 litre Blue HDI 130 diesel model sits in group 21E in base elegance form, 22E in performance line guise, and 23E if you go for a uh, prestige trim. The top HDI 180 diesel and PureTech 225 petrol variants, meanwhile, share the same ratings. Group 29E with performance line trim, 30E with prestige spec, and 31E if you go for this ultra prestige model. Charismatic, elegant and satisfyingly rare, the DS7 Crossback does indeed bring something different to the upper class part of the mid-sized SUV segment. It's an interesting confection this, relatively conservative in its overall exterior shaping but extreme and individualistic in its Gallic cabin demeanour. Will there be enough premium segment customers wanting this kind of combination? It'll be interesting to see. Now, apparently you'll be a target buyer if you're someone who's in tune with the latest trends, appreciates luxury, and likes to express their unique personality. Well, that sounds good in the brochure, but will it really translate into a segment slavishly committed to Teutonic design and a class in which aspiring premium brands have traditionally struggled? Uncertain residual values and a relatively small dealer network won't help the DS people here. 
For all that though, the Crossback deserves to carve out a niche for itself. The active scan suspension system may not be completely groundbreaking, but it's the most innovative thing we've so far seen from the brand. And it does at least give this model one area where it can genuinely claim to set new segment standards. And we also think this car is well sized and we appreciate the running cost efficiency of the blue HDI diesel engines that most customers will choose. Ultimately though, we like it because it feels special, or at least it will for the right kind of buyer. That customer will love the painstaking attention that's been paid to almost every detail of this design. Now in some respects, uh, the execution isn't perfect, but then, as we've remarked before when reviewing this boutique French maker's product and considering its competitors, there is something, well, rather soulless and clinical about perfection. The DS brand is about a different spirit, a different way to go. Other marks have promised that. With this car, though, this one delivers it.